good testing techniques. Um, testing, ladies and gentlemen, is an art, and some people can oops can share um, share knowledge about it at uh, at bug parties. So please apply them. Teams find them fun. Teams find them productive. They will give me uh, numbers on estimates of the number of, of defects out there, and it will get you further along to delivering quality quality, quality product. And it's better than uh, better finding a bug amongst your teammates in a bug party and advancing your teaching skills than to find it when you're presenting it to me. Okay. Um, Okay, enhancing quality for object-oriented systems. I wanted to talk a little bit about object-oriented testing, testing for object-oriented systems. Um, so there was a hope in the dawn of the object-oriented era, um, which really began in a strong way in the late 80s, um, that reuse driven by object-oriented techniques, by inheritance, for example, in and associated with that polymorphism would, um, would greatly lessen the defects out there. The idea is we'd reuse our code base. Rather than writing it anew, we'll be able to reuse these components and therefore they'd be tried and true. We put them into place and um, rather than writing code that had bugs in it anew, we would uh, be able to you know, stand on the shoulders of giants. Um, and there has been some benefits, but they've been less. And in 470, some of you were in my 470 class, we talked quite a bit about Liskov substitution principle and risks of subclassing. We're going to see just a glimpse of that here. But suffice it to say that object-oriented techniques have distinctive risks associated with certain properties. One of them is encapsulation. The fact, what do I mean by encapsulation in a software engineering context? The software. <coughs> Um, uh, makes use of encapsulation in order to enhance modularity of the software or in order to, to improve code quality. We don't, what do I mean by encapsulation? It doesn't show you what it's doing. Exactly. It separates the, why, the what it does from the how. It basically prevents you from, from uh, if, if you're a user of that class, from knowing all about the internal details, like what fields it has, what are the variables it uses internally, from being able to call any method in, you have only a very well-defined interface that you can call. Um, uh, another, so encapsulation is an issue. It turns out when we encapsulate, it really helps the software engineering, but it can raise challenges for testing effectively, because you can't Within white box tests, you can't easily look within that, that object and see exactly what's going on. Subtyping and polymorphism, and its association with what are called dynamic binding, the fact that we dispatch off, we, we see the apparent type, but we dispatch off the actual type when we call a function. This can cause challenges as well. Um, what do we mean by polymorphism? Anyone? Okay, it's related to inheritance, and typically the mechanisms we use for inheritance, subclassing, gives us polymorphism as well, it gives us subtyping. Um, so it often goes along with inheritance, but not always so. Uh, if you look at mixins or traits in Scala, those give you a lot of benefits of reusing code in sort of an inheritance-like way, but they actually don't give polymorphism. And increasingly people recognize these are two related things, but they're often, we, we will not infrequently want to separate them. Polymorphism, so is related to that, but can anyone give me another sense? What does it mean to be polymorphic? Suppose this code is, yes? Like generics in Java? Okay, so generics often make heavy use of polymorphism in the sense that one is a subtype of another. So we might have a list that's generic list. It's a list of person. And it's a subtype, for example, of iterable of person, something like that. So we can iterate through it. So they make heavy use of subtyping. We can pass it around as if it's an iterable or as if it's a collection. So all the things that operate on iterables and all the things you can do with an iterable, like loop through it, we can do with a list. Right? Um, 
So subtyping goes along with Paul Morrison to say that a subtype can be passed around as if it's an instance of the supertype. Um, I could pass around a hash table as if it's a collection, as if it a, a implements a dictionary interface. Um, and I can pass around a, uh, an array as if it's a, or an array list, as if it's a collection, et cetera. Um, inheritance and subclassing is another thing that comes along with object oriented that has its own, its own really uh, substantive risks associated with it. Because now we have a separate person writing the superclass that is writing the subclass. And the person writing the subclass is calling things that involve the superclass, but the superclass may evolve separately from your subclass. Over the course of your career, you may write code in Java, and all your Java objects are using, are using the code for Java, the, the object class in, in Java, right? Java.line.object. But they're using the object class code. And that code may evolve. You may you install a new version of Java, and that code for object has changed, but your code for your class has not changed. But what it's using has changed in an invisible way. And conceivably, that change that they made could, if you're not careful, break your code. Um, and then we have type parameterization, which really gets to the, to the um, uh, issue of generics. And your name? Wow. Kyle. The Kyle adventure. Type parameterization. We can make a given class um, have a parameterized type. So a list of person, a hash table from string to, to person, a, um, uh, an array list of integer or what have you. So it turns out that these, the presence of these things can complicate our testing. And there's different testing needs when we're dealing with code that, that uh, associates this, okay? So if we, if we know what, what's risky here, we can test for that in ways that are more savvy, that are not just simply traditional white box or black box testing code, but are, are object-oriented specific tests. And here are some common failure modes in object-oriented programming. These failure modes have been responsible um, for some of them for just thousands and thousands of, of errors. Um, and the first is, uh, for those who are in 470, you'll recognize it as a violation of the Liskov substitution principle. The subtype is not a behavioral subtype of, of its super, often its super class, okay? Um, so it, it claims to be, it claims to be a subtype, it claims to be um, able to be passed around as the super type or super class, for example, but it doesn't act that way. It acts in a way that's, that's not consistent with what someone would assume from the super type. Um, there's also an issue where the, the subclass has, um, uh, has an implementation that ends up being incompatible with that of the super class. The super class evolves, perhaps, um, in a way that throws the subclass off. Um, another problem is that within your code, in object-oriented code, you may have a subclass, and it calls off to a method, which is then executed in the superclass, and that method calls off to an overrided method, which is, uh, is executed in your class. And you have this kind of going back and forth of execution between your class and the superclass that can be hard to understand and hard to test. You can't, ladies and gentlemen, you cannot mock out a superclass. We've talked about how mocking, if you have several classes depending on each other, A depends on B, C, and D, we can mock these things out using Makito or JMock or, or their variants in JavaScript, etc. We could create mocks for these so we can focus on A. The problem is, if A has a superclass, we can't mock that out easily. It's part of A. A overrides some things in it, it extends it, but we can't mock it out easily. And as a result, it's harder to, harder to test A's, you know, the code we wrote for A compared to the, the superclass code. Encapsulation can hide illegal values you can't see. Um, and, um, you know, generic types 
need to be tested often with the different types with which they're instantiated throughout your program. Um, so you use them, you know, you instantiate this generic type with this class and with this class as type parameters and you want to test it with that. Um, and then there are cases where like a subclass constructor doesn't properly initialize the superclass and so the superclass is in a whacked out state and the subclass is trying to is trying to proceed in a normal way, but it's got this superclass that's not fully initialized. It can be a real issue. So these are some common failures. Next time, we're going to be talking about some ways that you can test against object-oriented code that will help guard you against some of these things, okay? Help, help uh, head off errors of this sort. And we'll talk about why these errors are so darn common, including code, ladies and gentlemen, that you may write during the term, okay? So tonight uh, we'll be doing some marking and I will, um, that's, that's the going plan. There's one final bit of confirmation being, being uh, planned. I will send mail to the project managers um, to notify you so that you can be on call for a certain period of time, okay? And if you wanna provide a delegate instead of you, you wanna have someone else go, that would be fine. We're gonna, the current plan is to begin testing, or begin testing, yes, but also um, going over ID2 at, uh, at 6 p.m., okay? So that's the plan, we'll probably be going till eight to nine-ish, somewhere like that. Okay, so thanks very much, and um, uh, today's uh, 4 p.m. Is, is up for uh, student teams um, to meet. And uh, I'll look forward to seeing some of you likely tonight. Okay? Thank you very much.